Hi, this is a short video on slots as they affect light aircraft operation in Europe. I'll talk about airport slots as well as apron slots and PPR and airway slots. Potentially, a flight could require five slots, an apron and airport slot at either end, and an airway slot in between, but that would be most unusual for our kind of flying. So, we'll start with airport slots. These are required at most big airports for departure and arrival. At some airports, they're issued by an automated system and are almost immediate. At others, it can take 24 hours or longer to get a slot. In my experience, the worst are the Balearic Islands, that's Mallorca and Menorca, where it's sometimes necessary to book up to a week in advance of peak season. At some of the busiest airports, you also need an apron slot to allow you to move onto the parking areas, and in many cases, you need to book parking. This last point can actually apply to the smallest airfields. The Scottish Islands and West Ireland Airport come to mind, where there may be only two or three parking spaces. My experience is that airports large enough to require an airport slot are also those with compulsory handling or a GA terminal who act as sort of handlers. This is good news because getting the slots is one of the services they provide within their fee. So all you need to do is call or email them and they'll just get the slots. Sometimes they ask you to fill in a form, which can be quite complex, and they might require supplementary information such as aircraft dimensions, copies of your certificates of registration, airworthiness, noise, insurance, or whatever. Everywhere is a bit different. In most places, it's quite easy. In a few, it's a nightmare. Generally speaking, the bigger the airport and the further south, by which I mean the Mediterranean or, God help us, Africa, the more difficult and bureaucratic it gets. However, there is a mechanism in some places, most noticeably Germany, where you can apply for your own slot. This is normally automated, quick and easy. Autorouter is particularly good at supporting you in this process by telling you where it's required and possible, and then formulating the rather complex message you need to send, as well as telling you where and how to send it. Once you have a slot, you generally have to put the confirmation string in your flight plan. The slot ID starts with the airport ID, followed by additional characters. If an apron slot is required, that will normally just follow in the wake of the airport slot, but you need to check with the handling agents. Generally speaking, airports and handling agents have a way of assuming that by some kind of magic, everyone knows and understands their Byzantine local system. So do be careful to ask questions and not to be put off by their passive aggressive shrugs of the shoulder and rolling of the eyes. Apart from official airport slots, there's also a system of PPR, prior permission required, sometimes called PNR, prior notice required. This is particularly endemic to the UK, where it's most unusual to find an airfield of any size, from farmer's field to major airport, where you don't need to notify them of your arrival and departure. This is sometimes done on a web form, sometimes by email, and sometimes by phone. On some web forms, you need to create an account first. In other countries, there's sometimes PPR, but it's usually associated with special events such as air shows or military exercises, and is notified by NOTAM. There's another kind of slot required for IFR approaches to small non-ATC airfields. This is again common in the UK, where the CAA have permitted the introduction of RMP approaches to a few small airfields, but then have made them as difficult to use as they can by imposing strict limitations. I've also come across small IFR airfields in Germany, where there are a limited number of IFR qualified information officers, and you need to pre-warn them of requiring the IFR approach, so the right person is rostered to be on the radio. So, I hope that covers airport slots and PPR, but my guess is that you'll be most interested in airways slots. When you file a flight plan, you put in as your departure time your estimated off-block time, EOBT. An allowance is made in the system, five minutes at small airfields, longer at bigger ones, between that and the time you're expected to take off. If you get a slot, it's a calculated takeoff time, or CTOT, CTOT. Thus, if you have an EOBT of 0830 from a small airfield, and you're given a slot of 0835, that is an on-time slot, because if you were off blocks at 0830, you would normally expect to be airborne at 0835 anyway. Although the technical term is CTOT, they're normally referred to as slots, and unless there's any ambiguity, that's how I'll refer to them from now on. You're told of the slot by the system you use to file the flight plan. This might be within the programme, 
by email, text, or telegram message, depending on the system you use and how you set it up. If all else fails, you'll be told by tower or ground when you call for start. This is actually one of the main reasons for the call to start. So, there are three situations you can find yourself in. Having no slot, having an on-time slot, and having a slot which delays your departure. A slot cannot be before your planned departure time. The difference between having no slot and an on-time slot is the range of times you can depart. With no slot, you can start to taxi in a 15-minute window either side of your EOBT, and if you're not going to make that window, you simply put in a delay for a later time or cancel and refile for an earlier time. It's all quite relaxed. But if you have an on-time slot, you must take off in a window five minutes before to 10 minutes after the slot, and if you don't, you risk substantial delays. You can't necessarily delay and still expect to get an on-time slot. So an on-time slot simply adds pressure for you to be at the hold at the front of the queue within that 15-minute window, but doesn't delay your flight. At a sizable airport, the existence of a slot, delay causing or not, should be managed by ATC in such a way that the departure sequence respects the allotted slots. If you're departing from an uncontrolled environment, it's up to you. But a slot can also be for a later time, and that is the worry for most people. It might be a 10 or 20 minute delay, but it can also be several hours. I've been given a five hour delay when carrying a UK cabinet minister. I won't identify him, but he had something of the night about him, to an intergovernmental conference. That caused all sorts of problems and some vicarious amusement. Sometimes people flying our kind of aircraft get very irritated because they have slot delays despite the fact that our flight levels are normally quite empty. It's certainly true that those of us flying in the 80 to 180 band are sharing the airspace with very little traffic, except in the TMA. There is a moderate amount of traffic in the 240 to 280 levels where air transport turboprops fly, but most commercial jet traffic is at 310 or above. So why can't we go where we want when we want? The answer mainly lies in controller workload expressed as declared sector capacity. It's often the same controller working all IFR levels, and each sector has a capacity regardless of aircraft level. This is less true in some parts of Europe, where there is a different control structure above and below level 240, but even then we have to share controllers in the TMAs, where both controllers and airspace may be at a premium. It seems to me that the requirement for slots goes in waves, with them getting more prevalent over the last few years, and I suspect that that is largely to do with an ongoing shortage of controllers. So, we might easily find ourselves having been subject to long slot delays, only to be faced with an irritatingly empty TCAS and quiet frequencies. But that is either because the controllers are busy on other frequencies, utilizing CP DLC data link instead of voice, or because the busy sector is the TMA at the other end. Incidentally, slots are often expressed as to achieve a time over a particular waypoint. But en route ATC doesn't usually appear to know or care about slots and just waves us through, even if we're early or late. Their expectation being that adherence to slots has managed the sector load globally rather than by individual aircraft. It's common that slots, once allocated, change. And they can change multiple times, usually for the better, by which I mean that each successive slot has an earlier time. Within the last couple of years, I've had on more than one occasion a two and a half hour delay change six or seven times, each change coming a few minutes after the previous one and ending up with an on-time slot. It can happen that you get an on-time slot at a time when it's too late to start and taxi to meet the slot. This is extremely frustrating and it can be more convenient to accept a delay than to continuously change the departure time, particularly if you have passengers. That way, you can send the passengers off to wait in a cafe with a reasonably certain knowledge of when you expect a taxi. To do this, you freeze the slot. That means that you won't be offered anything earlier, though you can still get a later slot. If you use Auto Router, this is very easy. You just type freeze into Telegram. When you're ready to start engines, you can type unfreeze and hope for an improvement. I don't believe that other tools like ForeFlight and Rocket Route have this facility but you can ask the tower ground controller to put in a SIP wanted message or SWM to say that no improvement will be accepted and later cancel it. Some towers will do this, some won't. The easiest thing is to use auto router if you can.
Slot delays are obviously a considerable inconvenience and annoyance, especially if you're flying on business, but also if you have a family event to get to, want to take friends out for, a, for the day or whatever. So let's talk of strategies to manage and mitigate the effects of slots, and particularly slot delays. The one thing that doesn't work is to get your slot and then to cancel and refile for an earlier time. You'll probably end up with a slot later than the original one. So if you file for 1200 and get a slot for 1300, so refile for 1100 in the hope of getting 1200, you may well get a slot for, say, 1400. One strategy that can work is always to put in an EOBT 45 minutes before you really want to go. Then, if you don't get a slot, you can simply delay your departure by 30 minutes and take off at the end of the minus 15 plus 15 window. If you get an on-time slot, you put in a delay and just hope to get another on-time slot. And if you get a delay, its effect is at least mitigated by 45 minutes. More sophisticated method is to look at forecast delays on the auto router map by switching on the tactical delays layer, seeing how long the delays are likely to be by looking at the colors and reading the captions at the bottom, and put in an EOBT that much earlier than you want to depart. Then, when you get a slot, freeze it as you don't want an improvement. If you're ready to start engines early, you can always ask the tower to put in a ready message. An alternative use of the tactical delays map is to file a route which avoids areas of significant delays. You can then hope that you're given a more direct route once you get airborne. There are times when the delay is so long that if you depart on the slot, the reason for going is lost. If you're traveling for a morning meeting and there's a three hour delay, you'll miss the meeting and may as well not go at all. Under those circumstances, you may decide to go VFR. VFR flight is subject to PPR, usually subject to airport slots, which you already have secured, but never subject to CTOT slots. Obviously, the weather has to be suitable for VFR, and it's up to you to decide whether it is. But using modern moving maps, with all the information they carry, including no terms, it's quite possible to pick a way to destination, either transiting or avoiding airspace on the way, without too much planning. You have to be particularly vigilant about airspace, so you'll arrive more tired and stressed than after a carefully planned IFR flight. But at least you'll arrive on time. You need to make your own assessment as to whether you are skilled, knowledgeable, experienced and fit enough to make a long flight under VFR without planning. The next question is, what happens if you miss your slot? Well, try not to. But if you're at a towered or information airfield, you can ask them firstly to get an extension which allows a maximum of 10 minutes, or if you're even later, put in a delay message with a new EOBT, but that could result in a long delay. If you're departing from an unconnected environment who will not be sending a departure message, and if you only miss your slot by a few minutes, I'd suggest getting airborne and calling the next frequency, whether FIS or ATC, as soon as possible and hope they don't query it. If you're too late, the plan will be suspended and you'll need to get an ATC unit to put in the delay message, or you can cancel and refile, risking longer delays. It's really best idea to get airborne on your slot. I think that's all I can usefully say about slots. May you get as few as possible and with as little delay as possible. See you in the next video.